Hello students, today we are going to start our discussion on electrochemical equilibrium. In your earlier lectures, we have seen how to deal with chemical equilibrium, but today's lecture is going to be different because now the chemical reaction that we talk about will, would be electrochemical reactions. As a result, the equilibrium situation that we are going to consider would be referred to as electrochemical equilibrium. Now, let me highlight the basic features of electrochemical equilibrium before I start elaborating on each of these uh, points. The first thing that we note is that an electrochemical reaction involves the transfer of one or more electrons between a metal and a component of a solution in contact with the metal. The next point that we need to understand is that the reason why we are interested in studying these electrochemical reactions is that under equilibrium of electrochemical reactions, they can be used to construct what are known as electrochemical cells. And these electrochemical cells are devices which convert chemical energy into electrical energy. The next point that I would like to highlight is that the electrochemical cells offer means of converting the changes in Gibbs free energy of a chemical reaction into work without any loss that is usually incurred by the heat engines as we have seen in our discussion of the second law of thermodynamics. And finally, we would talk about electrolytic cells why, where the electric current is used to drive a cell reaction which does not otherwise take place spontaneously. In electrochemical cells, you may please note that a chemical reaction happens spontaneously as a result of which electric current flows through an external circuit. And that is where the chemical energy is getting converted to electrical energy. In contrast, in electrolytic cells, you have electric current driving the cell reaction and the cell reaction here must be one which does not spontaneously occur in the absence of the electric current. Now, let me once again emphasize the systems of interest for the current discussion. So, an electrochemical cell. We do come across these electrochemical cells every day in our uh, life. And so these are the devices for interconversion of chemical energy and in electrical energy. And we will be particularly interested in what are known as galvanic cells or voltaic cells. And these are cells which produces electricity as a result of a spontaneous chemical reaction. And therefore, as you see, you can use some, many of these batteries in the different devices that you use in your everyday life, like batteries for your watch, batteries for your mobile phone. Some of them are rechargeable, some of them are not. But you have a variety of examples known to us, which would produce electricity as a result of a spontaneous chemical reaction. Now, whenever you start on a topic like this, it is found convenient to have some basic aspects of the systems of interest clarified at the very beginning. So, in this connection, I will remind you of the basic representations that are used to uh, repre uh, represent the electrochemical cells. 
Now, the electrochemical cells that we are talking about can be of many different types. Here in the first type, type A, I have two metal electrodes immersed in the same electrolyte and these are the contact points through which these two electrodes are connected to an external circuit. Therefore, if there is a spontaneous chemical reaction occurring in this cell, I would expect the current through fl uh, to flow through this external circuit. The fundamental construction of the cell can be a little different as shown by the example taken here. The difference between the example A and the example B is that now I am employing two metal electrodes. One is the zinc electrode and the second one is the copper electrode. And these two electrodes are kept in contact with an electrolyte solution of their own. So, the zinc the solid zinc electrode is kept in contact with an aqueous zinc sulfate solution which I call is the electrolyte of the solid zinc electrode. And when I talk about the copper electrode, this has been kept in contact with the aqueous copper sulfate solution. And these two solu electrolyte solutions are separated by what is known as a porous spot. And therefore, as you see that here this existence of this porous spot is given here in the representation by giving a colon. And therefore, you see that this is a shorthand notation of the detailed structure of the cell that I have shown here. So once again, this cell will be capable of producing electricity in an external circuit, it will drive electric current through an external circuit under suitable conditions. Now, let us have a look at the type C electrode where as you see that there is no contact between the two electrolytes. Here, no direct contact between the two electrolytes. This is the zinc sulfate aqueous solution which acts as the electrolyte for the solid zinc electrode. And here is the copper sulphate aqueous solution serving as the electrolyte for the copper electrode. Now, if you have to transfer the electrons continuously from one part of the cell, one electrode of the cell to the other, you must complete the circuit which requires another contact to be kept between the two electrolyte solutions. And in this case, this is done, this is performed, this, uh, this work is performed by a salt bridge. So, in uh, general practice, a salt bridge is a very highly concentrated potassium chloride solution in agar agar jelly that provides the necessary electrical contact between the two electrolyte solutions as shown in this figure. And in a shorthand notation, as you see, we have put a, a two vertical bars indicating the presence of a salt bridge between the two electrodes. Now, for every such cell representation, as you see, uh, there are these single lines which show that this is a combination of two phases of two uh, components. This is a solid electrode and this is the liquid electrolyte. And since there is a phase difference between the two components, there is a single vertical line which separates them. Similarly, for the copper electrode, you have a phase difference between the copper solid and the aqueous copper sulphate solution. And this contact is indicated by this solid line. And therefore, as you see that the summary of these representations would tell you whether there is a phase difference between two components in contact. And 
if there is there are two liquids whether they are connected by a porous separator or whether they are connected by a salt bridge. Now all these details are indeed important to find out how these cells work. But we will not go into the details of that, rather let me focus on one of these uh, generic uh, representation of a cell, one of the cells that I have uh, uh, shown to you. I am going to label the different parts of a representative cell. So here, do you know which type of cell I am showing to you? Yes, I am showing to you one cell that has two metal electrodes in separate compartments that are immersed in their respective electrolyte solutions. So here I have the positive electrode which I call the cathode. Here I have the negative electrode which I call the anode. So on this part of the compartment which I call the anode compartment, I have this electrolyte solution which is in contact with the anode. And here on this side of the compartment which I call the cathode compartment, I have another electrolyte which serves as the electrolyte in contact with the cathode. And here I have put in a porous barrier between the two electrolyte solutions and this may be either a porous barrier or a salt bridge. Now if I connect the two electrodes by a conducting wire, then electrons will flow from the negative electrode that is the anode towards the cathode. Therefore, I would say that there will be the current flowing in this direction by convention. Now, during the, this entire process of passing electrons from the anode to the cathode, you understand that the circuit is completed within the solution by the movement of anions towards the anode and the cations towards the cathode. And therefore, it is convenient to say that here reduction occurs at the cathode and oxidation occurs at the anode. And because of these reactions, there will be an electron flow, spontaneous electron flow through the external circuit. Now moving forward, then it is convenient to put the anode on left and the cathode on right while writing down the shorthand representation of these galvanic cells. So this is a typical shorthand representation of the galvanic cell where I have put the anode on the left and the cathode on the right. Now the electrons therefore will flow from left to right. Now I have already mentioned that at the anode the reaction that takes place is the solid zinc converts into zinc 2 plus and it gives out two electrons. Therefore, this ion now goes into the solution in contact with it and gets dissolved and anode accumulates excess electrons. And since the neutral zinc is going into the zinc 2 plus state, I would say with the loss of electron, I would say that oxidation is taking place at the anode and the anode is placed on the left. Therefore, by convention, oxidation reaction takes place on the left of the galvanic cell. Similarly, if we look at the chemical reaction taking place at the cathode, then I find that copper 2 plus will take up two electrons and get converted into solid copper at the cathode. And this would tell you that of course copper 2 plus is getting reduced to copper 0 and 
this happens on the cathode at the cathode and the cathode is placed on the right therefore reduction on the right and as you understand that there are two sets of chemical reactions taking place in this setup one is the oxidation the other one is the reduction and therefore these are called the half cell reactions so this is the first half shell showing the oxidation on left this is the second half shell showing the reduction on right and the two half cells together give you the chemical reaction in the galvanic cell which is called the cell reaction now once again let me remind you that here the single vertical line represents the boundary between electrode and the electrolyte and here it is also clear that it is a phase boundary and as you see that here I have two vertical lines which indicates that I have a salt bridge between the zinc electrode and its uh, uh, zinc 2 plus aqueous solution and the copper electrode and copper 2 plus aqueous solution. So now that we have introduced all the technical names, let me go ahead and remind you of some fundamental aspects that are essential for building up the thermodynamic concept in such electrochemical cells. Let me begin by reminding you about the Coulomb's law. If there are two charges Q1 and Q2 interacting with each other, when they are separated by a distance r, then the force acting on them is given by this expression where F is proportional to 1 by r square. And this immediately tells us that like charges will re repel each other while unlike charges if one is positive q1 is positive and q2 is negative in that case there will be an attractive force between the two charges from here we can immediately look at what is known as the magnitude of electric field strength now this is given by the electric force on unit charge due to another charge q therefore in this expression if I put Q1 equal to 1 and Q2 equal to some capital Q, then what I get is the magnitude of electric field strength and this is given by an expression like this. Next we have the concept of electric potential at a distance r. The electric potential at a distance r from the charge Q is then given by phi that is equal to q by r which is the potential associated with this electric field strength and here the unit of the potential is in joules per coulomb. Now if I plot phi as a function of r I understand that the magnitude of phi that is the electric potential would depend on whether I am at a distance r from a positive charge q or a negative charge q and depending on whether my q is positive or negative you will see that phi is a strong function of r and it can be either a positive number or a negative number. With this background in mind let me consider the thermo thermodynamics of electrochemical equilibrium where I shall start by thinking about two points in space as shown as 1 and 2 in this picture. Now the electric potential at either of these points would be given by phi i that I can once again define as w i by q. Now what is w i? This says that this is the amount of work 
done to begin uh, to bring a charge q to this point i from an infinite distance if that is so then let me next try to evaluate the amount of work done to bring the charge q in this space from 1 to the point 2 and I would be able to write down that w1 plus w12 must be equal to w2 and this is simply because electric field is conservative in nature and therefore what I can do is I can write down using this relation and this relation that phi 2 minus phi 1 which by this definition is w2 by q minus w1 by q and this must be given by w12 by q and once you have this then you immediately conclude that the difference in electric potential between two points is equal to the amount of work expended in taking a unit charge from one point to the other. Now with this expression in mind, let me now consider the transfer of an infinitesimal charge dq between the points 1 and 2. If I take this infinitesimal amount of charge, then what is going to be phi 2 minus phi 1? That is going to be a ratio of del w 1 2 and dq where del w 1 2 is the infinitesimal amount of work done in transferring the infinitesimal charge from the potential phi 2 to a potential phi 1. Now let me denote by epsilon this quantity that is shown on the right hand side. I will be calling this quantity the potential difference between the points 1 and 2. So in this case I can very easily say that if del WL is the infinitesimal work produced during the transfer then del W12 must be equal to negative of del WEL and that can be very easily said to be equal to epsilon or e into dq. Now while playing around with these equations the conclusion that I would like to draw here is as follows. The work involved in an electrochemical cell depends on the equilibrium involving the potential differences. Now while talking about electrochemical equilibrium let me also highlight two of the very important contributions that come from the using the electrolyte solution. The first one is an electroneutrality condition and you see that if Ni is the number of ions present in the electrolyte solution where each of the ions carry a charge of Zi into E. In that case, the electroneutrality condition would require that by summing over Ni into Zi for all types of ions present in the medium must be equal to 0. So while you are thinking about an electrochemical cell, you must have this additional constraint on the composition of phase that is present in the electrolyte solution. And then you also must realize that when I have transfer of ions across a potential difference, if DNI ion is transferred where each of these DNI ions bear this charge Zie, there will be a differential amount of charge transferred and that would be equal to Zi into DNI multiplied by f. Now here zi is greater than 0, it is a positive number for cations and it is a negative number for anions 
and f is the celebrated Faraday constant whose value is very accurately known to be 96,500 coulombs per mole. So, in the next part of my lecture, I am going to use all these concepts to establish the condition of electrochemical equilibrium in an electrochemical cell and how we uh, how we relate the electrochemical equilibrium to the amount of work that can be extracted from this cell. Thank you.